Let's join together in our opening prayer. Almighty God, in whom service lies perfect freedom, teach us to obey you with loving hearts and steadfast wills through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Good morning to you all. We welcome you to First United Methodist Church of Florence, Alabama. God counts us as his special people, and this is a special place when we gather together to worship our God. Let's stand together and let's sing together, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. remain standing and let us unite in the historic confession of our Christian faith, the Apostles' Creed, which you can find printed in your bulletin and also in 881 in your hymnal. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. seated. Good morning and welcome to First United Methodist Church here in Florence, Alabama. I'm Dale Cohen, senior pastor, and want to add a word of greeting to that which our associate, Reverend Dr. Terry Stubblefield, has already shared. So glad that you're with us today. want to encourage everybody here in the sanctuary to fill out the connection card, the little tear-off section on the end of the worship guide, and when the offering is collected, you can put it uh, in the offering plate as it comes by. If you're visiting, please feel free to share your information. We're not going to harass you in any way. We just would like to say thank you uh, for your visit with us today. In whatever means you would like for us to do that, telephone call, text, email, card, letter, carrier pigeon, uh, that one might be a little difficult want to welcome those of you who are watching online as well. Thank you for being with us today. Uh, we love that you're here. Uh, although you're not physically present, your presence is felt here, and we hope that you will participate in every way in the service just as if you were here. And want to encourage everybody uh, online, whether you're on Facebook, watching Facebook Live in the comment section, let us know you're here, or on YouTube. Um, you can also go to our website, fumcflow.org, and click on the registration link to let us know uh, that you're worshiping with us today. We are in the midst of our fall stewardship campaign, and I want to invite Eric O'Neill to come, and Eric is going to share with us. Eric, here he is, there he is. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I talked to Dell a few weeks ago and asked if I could share a little bit of my story uh, since it's stewardship season. Is that right? All right. So uh, I've got a couple of, uh, I don't know, kind of cute stories, funny stories. It's okay if you laugh. And then I've got one a little bit more serious. But I just, I, every chance I get to give my testimony on fearless giving, I, I really just cherish those opportunities. So. When I was about that little girl's age, uh, maybe, maybe a year or two younger than her, and I know it by the church that we were attending, I had perfect attendance in Sunday school for however long, and my prize was this little blue coin pouch, and in gold it said, Jesus loves you on it. I don't know how I remember all these little details of, of being that young, but I remember it. And one Sunday, as the offering plate was coming by, I, look, I pulled my little my little coin pouch out and I just dumped everything in it in the offering plate and my mom was a pretty smart pretty savvy lady she kindergarten teacher she was sitting there and she saw what went on and she didn't say anything and um, I guess I think she wanted me to be genuine with my giving and then after the service was over she said I saw what you did and you should always give to God and then she gave me twice as much money to put in my coin pouch, my empty coin pouch, as I, as I put in the offering plate. And uh, I, was pr I was pretty smart like that one. The next Sunday, I tried to pour it all in again. She's like, nope. <laughs> so that, that's not how this works. And uh, probably, and I've, I've got tons of these stories, and I'm just going to share a couple with you, but probably when I was a little bit older, I was probably about my son Cade's age, 
fifth or sixth grade, somewhere around then, and I was really into music, and I'd saved all my money, and I wanted to buy a, a CD, probably an inappropriate CD, the opposite of what, you know, probably not a gospel CD. And uh, anyway, so I'd, I'd had this, you know, calling that I've, that I've gotta have this thing. And then for some reason, I was in a church service uh, that week, and I, I can even remember the exact wallet I had. It was like a blue jean wallet with leather on it, you know, something from the early 90s. And I pulled all my money out that I was gonna use to buy that music with, and I put it in the offering plate. Didn't say a word to anybody. The next week, and I, I just was like, I, just for whatever reason, I was like, this is what I'm, I feel like this is what I'm supposed to do. Well, the next week, in my small little town, we had like a Dollar General slash pharmacy slash flower shop, and my mom was shopping, and I would just go off and read the uh, cards. Like, they would have funny birthday cards, Valentine cards, that kind of stuff. So here I am, you know, about that little boy's age, walking around looking at all these cards, and I open one up, and there's twice as much money in it. Somebody had apparently put money in this card, and I guess they were going to give it to somebody, and they, for some reason, put it back on the shelf. And so I found it. My mom was like, well, take it to the front. So I took it to the front, and the pharmacist slash manager, you know, small town, you're like every role. And they were like, well, if nobody calls, we'll, we'll give it to you. And so I ended up doubling my money again. <laughs> Not intentionally. At that time it was, you know, uh, it was sincere. And uh, like I said, I just felt like there was, you know, God was saying, trust me, give to me and I'll give back to you. Yeah. And then uh, on a, like a more, I don't know, less funny note, my wife and I, we, we grew up in Arkansas, moved to Tuscaloosa, didn't know a soul. Uh, we had worked our rear ends off, saving money all throughout our undergrad. I worked three jobs to pay my whole way through college. Uh, Whitney was really smart, so she had scholarships, so she didn't have to pay her way through, through college. Um, but when we moved to Tuscaloosa in the summer of 2007, we decided we, we'd just gotten married. We decided we were going to buy a house. I had a complete plan. I'm, a, I'm the budget guy. I don't, she doesn't trust me with checks. I literally can't carry a check around. If money's dispensed, it comes through, through my wife. But I'm in charge of keeping up with the budget. And so we knew, we, we both were expecting to get graduate assistantships that paid $1,000 a month. We knew our mortgage payment was gonna be $1,000 total. And um, when you, whenever you go to grad school, if you get an assistantship, they pay for your school. And so, I mean, I had everything planned out. It was all in my hands. You know, I, I, I had my little Excel spreadsheet every month and how much money we were spending. And then the day before school started, uh, the University of Alabama decided that they were not going to give Whitney an assistantship. If you've ever heard her play the flute, you know that she is very talented. Uh, but they made this decision, and the other decision that they made was that if she wanted to continue in school, we were going to have to pay out-of-state tuition. And uh, let's see, so about half of our bank account was gone before school, the first day of school. Uh, the next spring, the tra uh, I had the transmission went out on my vehicle, so there was another about 30% of my yearly salary was gone. Uh, that summer, our HVAC unit went out in a little house that we bought. So between my car and the HVAC repairs, 50% of my yearly salary was gone. And I was getting ready to pay, or I say I, we were getting ready to pay out-of-state tuition again. And man... Uh, there is, there's nothing like being in school and knowing that your costs are going up and your income and your bank account is dwindling every single month. And I knew at some point those two things were going to intersect. And the anxiety of just every month not knowing if you can pay for groceries. Uh, I was training for a marathon, but I had to back out on because I couldn't afford the entry fee. And I was literally wearing shoes with holes in them for months, waiting for my parents to hopefully buy me some new shoes at Christmas. And my pastor at Taylorville Methodist uh, in Tuscaloosa asked me if I would get up and speak one week. 
And I got up and man, I, I just, I just let it all out. I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I am, I, I'm just sinking here. And, uh, school was excellent. Um, uh, but I just, I didn't know how I was going to pay my mortgage. And I knew that that time frame was like dwindling down to nothing. And on top of it, the other the stressful thing was my, my department chair at the time, the first day of school, he told us that he had caught an, a graduate assistant. And again, we only made a thousand dollars a month working at a gas station one night and he fired him on the spot. So he said, if you get an outside job and you can't be on call for us basically 24 uh, seven, you won't get to continue to be a, a, a graduate assistant. And then I would have had to pay for school. So I, I had the ability to work and I, but I couldn't. And it was one of the most frustrating things. And um, so in that church service, when my pastor asked me to speak, Whitney and I, again, my, my salary was $1,000 a month, and I committed to God that I was gonna give 10% of it no matter what. And so every month, Whitney would let me put a $100 check in the offering plate. And um, after that service, some nice person in the church came up and gave my pastor, not knowing that I gave $100 a month of my tithe, I uh, gave my pastor $200, two crisp $100 bills, and he came and he, he told me, he said, hey, this, this person doesn't want, to know who, doesn't want you to know who gave this to you, but this person gave you $200. So um, it was, again, it was twice what I put in there. I mean, just the, and I, I mean, I call it a miracle. I don't think it was coincidence at all. Um, and so the only bad part was, the, my income was still steady and it was, well really my income was like down here steady <laughs> and my bills were, go, or our bills were going up. And I took that $200 and the next Sunday, I put both of those bills in the offering plate. And I, I gambled on God. And um, you know, uh, Mr. Dale was talking about like the prosperity gospel, like you give and you're supposed to get helicopters and Lamborghinis and all that stuff. I wasn't asking for that. I, I literally, there was one night I drove home and they had those dollar roast beef sandwiches at Arby's. It was 11 o'clock, I was just leaving the lab, had to be back there at five o'clock the next morning. And, I, and I, 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 I'll never remember, never forget thinking this to myself, I can't afford a $1 Arby's sandwich. I have to go home and eat some dry Cheerios. And, uh, and so the struggle was just there. And man, I mean, it just, if you've ever lived like that and knowing that there's an inevitable end to what you're working on and working towards and there's nothing you can do about it, it's very humbling. And so I still kept working hard and I'd, I'd honestly kind of forgotten about putting that money back in the offering plate. And for the next four months, I was just grinding. I was trying to, the only way I could make extra money was if I got grants, external grant funding. And um, because the school gets almost half of it. So they were okay with me making, <laughs> making money through grants. And uh, I do hydration, exercise physiology research, and I've done some work with Powerade Zero had just come out. Uh, Coca-Cola makes Powerade Zero. And I would, every week I was emailing, hey, I did this study, I think that Coca-Cola would really like to see the results in a, a larger sample. And about four or five months went by, then I was in my happy place. My friend Giddis and I were out fishing uh, in my little flat bottom boat. That was like my, my getaway. And I got, and we were on spring break and I randomly got this call from Georgia. And it, it was an Atlanta number. And I was like, who could this possibly be? And it was somebody, it was a representative from the research and uh, design department from Coca-Cola that worked at Powerade. And they told me that I think they'd gotten so annoyed that every week I was sending them this great study they needed to fund. They said, I'm, I'm Dr. Poulos, and I think we want to fund your study. And I was able to use that grant to pay myself on top of my normal assistantship, which I still had to work. And we got out of Tuscaloosa on fumes, but that money that we got from that grant, I mean, it literally, we wouldn't be here today. We would have had to drop out of school, I don't know what we would have been doing and we would have already been in a ton of debt, uh, but I know we wouldn't be here today. And that's just, I, I just wanna encourage you to, to give fearlessly. And 
I, I'd done so much to put my faith in myself that I really had got gotten to the point where I was just so low. I didn't I didn't have any options left, and and God was the only person that was going to come in and and save the day. Um, so I just I just want to encourage you, and, and I don't know it doesn't have to be financial giving, but if you can give to where it becomes uncomfortable, I, I really believe God recognizes that, and um, you learn what you what's really important in life, and and that situation has made me so fearless in other situations that don't have anything to do uh, with finance, but just doing the right thing, uh, knowing that God's there. And if you keep putting your faith in him, um, he's going to take care of you. And it may take a while. You may have to eat Cheerios for four or five months and lose 12 pounds per month because you're not eating and working 80 hours a week. But uh, God is there. And I just thank you for letting me share that with you. Thank you, Eric. Want to remind you, we've got our regular schedule this week, Wednesday evening activities, dinner at 5. You know how to do the reservations on the connection card or call the church office. And then uh, programming at 6 p.m. Uh, don't forget uh, Roy Stevens, 100th birthday party next week at noon, from noon to 2. And then from 3 to 6 at River Heritage Park, we've got our fall festival and uh, this is an intergenerational event. Uh, bring lawn chairs. Uh, there will be some chairs there if you don't have lawn chairs, but just come and have a great time interacting with other folks and, and getting to know people. Uh, and that's next week. Um, also, the Connect and Serve survey is available. Uh, hard copy as well as you can use the QR code. Uh, and this is our this helps us help you determine where you can best serve in the life of the church. I do want to mention a need uh, that we're going to be addressing on Sunday, November 3rd. Uh, that is a Communion Sunday and All Saints Sunday. Uh, on the Communion Sundays, we uh, receive a Communion Rail offering that when you come up for your offering, if you want to leave an offering just here on either side of the Communion Rail, um, that money goes towards our benevolence fund. Uh, there's a local ministry, it's called Home Free Haven. You may be more familiar with what it used to be called, and that's Room in the Inn. And this is a ministry that during the winter months houses uh, people who are homeless in local churches. Um, Tara and Will Willis are the executive directors of this ministry. And honestly, this ministry just kind of fell in their lap. They were helping somebody out who had the vision for carrying on room in the inn, but not the capacity. Well, they had the leadership capacity, uh, but as, as things have developed, it's all on them. And they have made tremendous sacrifices um, trying to keep this ministry afloat. And we hope to be able to host... Uh, this year, we're looking for a coordinator to uh, help host here at our church on a Friday or Saturday night uh, because we can only do those evenings because of security in the day school. Um, but um, on Sunday, November 3rd, all of the offering that is placed on the communion rail will go to Home Free Haven. And so I just wanted you to be aware of that, and I'll mention it again next week. Um, but just uh, be in planning for that. But I also want to celebrate that uh, for hurricane relief that we have raised $5,360 that has been sent to the United Methodist Committee on Relief for hurricane relief. I'm so proud of the, the giving that, uh, that you all do when I, when I ask you over and over again to support these things. Uh, you always step up and do it, and I'm so grateful to you for that. And i um, very glad that, that we're a part of helping those uh, who, for the next several years, are going to be in recovery uh, from the storms that have occurred recently. As we prepare to receive our offering this morning, I want to invite Calvin to offer the prayer of consecration for our guests. Calvin? Let us pray. Dear Lord, the love of God is more new in the world as often as we embody that love 
in the works of compassion, peace, and justice. Let us offer our gifts in a spirit of generosity and hope. And with these gifts, dear Lord, accept the praise and thanksgiving from our hearts, which rejoice in the goodness and love. Let our life gifts point to your presence in the world and further your dream through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you. 
Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for the example that you have given to us for how we should live our lives. Help us to follow your example in caring for all those around us. Help us to embrace our roles as your servants and to be all that we can be to ourselves and also to one another. May we learn not to make excuses and to make things right when we do things that are wrong. Teach us to know our duty and to help do that duty joyfully. Help us to act in all things in harmony with your will as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples when he taught them, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark. As such, I'd ask you to stand for its reading. Mark 10, verses 35 through 45. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it that you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Appoint us to sit, one at your right hand, and one at your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or be baptized with the baptism, with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or my left is not mine to appoint, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they became angry with James and John. So Jesus called to them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those who they recognize as their leaders lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. Instead, whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life for the ransom of many. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Out of your word and into our hearts, may your truth take root and grow until we're overwhelmed by your love and by your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever done something kind for someone and felt disappointed when they didn't acknowledge it? Maybe it was something as simple as holding a door for someone to walk through and they walked on through and they didn't even acknowledge that you were there or even offer a nod. Or perhaps you stayed late at work to help a colleague, but your coworker didn't acknowledge your help when your boss credited the, the coworker with having done a good job. We all know the satisfaction of helping others, but if we're being honest, there's often a tiny voice asking, well, does anybody notice all I do? The tension between selfless service and the desire for recognition is everywhere. We certainly see it in the gospel lesson for today. James and John, two of Jesus' closest disciples, struggled with this. They want positions of honor and prestige in the kingdom. But Jesus sees this as an opportunity to teach about a different kind of greatness, one that doesn't seek status or applause. It's grounded in humble service and sacrifice. Today we'll wrestle with the question, what does it mean to be great in the kingdom of God? It doesn't look like any worldly greatness, and that's the point. But it is a greatness that will satisfy our souls at a much deeper level. 
The world has expectations about service that are reflected in this statement. You must serve me beyond my greatest expectations. Successful business models have been developed around this idea of service that exceeds expectations. And brands like Ritz-Carlton, Neiman Marcus, and Emirate Air cater to those who feel like they deserve only the very best. This model taps into the belief that we all have that, you know what, we deserve better. We could refer to this as the James and John syndrome. Despite Jesus' prediction of his suffering and death, James and John ask a foolish and self-serving question. Will Jesus give them a high-ranking position in the kingdom when it comes? It's as if they didn't hear anything about the suffering and persecution before the kingdom would arrive. They only heard about the glory on the horizon. That's what they focused on. James and John think they deserve seats of honor in that kingdom. The scripture says, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask you to do. And he asked them, What do you want me to do for you? They said, Appoint us to sit, one at your right and one at your left hand, in your glory. Now let's not be too critical of James and John here because the only difference between them and us is that they spoke their expectations out loud. For us, most of our expectations are unstated and maybe even unconscious. We think God should give us an easier life in return for our faithfulness. We, should, we would never ask for him to put us on the left and right of him in his kingdom. No. We're not those kind of folks. However, we're not above asking God to show us a little favor by helping us get a promotion at work or maybe even making it so we find out that the medical test results that we got back weren't ours, but it was a mistake, or that somehow through our faithfulness, God will help us win the lottery. What, when we expect something from God in return for our faithfulness, what we're doing is we're making God into a transactional God. But God is not a transactional God. God is a relational God. And because God is relational, His idea of greatness is based on our relationship with one another. Let's call this the Jesus Syndrome. In responding to his disciples' request, Jesus offers a reality check. The scripture says, Jesus said, you don't know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? They replied, we're able. Then Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And the baptism with which I am baptized, you will also be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or my left is not mine to appoint. These places are for those for whom it has been prepared. Instead of criticizing the disciples' inability to grasp the consequences of a request such as theirs, Jesus affirms that there's a desire to serve. There's a desire to drink the cup and a desire to be baptized with the baptism that he was baptized with. His point, though, is that when they see what the cup and the baptism represent, it won't feel like an honor, but rather it will feel like a burden. Although Jesus was gracious, the other disciples were not. They became angry. And Jesus acknowledged their anger, but he continued his lesson on what we could call kingdom greatness. The scripture says, so Jesus said, you know, that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. Instead, whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you 
must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Those who rule over us, as we know all too well, often abuse their power for personal gain. They impose unfair and oppressive rules on us, but not on them. They exploit us and our labor, and they attempt to control us through fear and manipulation. Worldly greatness operates as a hierarchy, and those who are great is seen as higher than the rest of us. The kingdom of God, though, is not a hierarchy. It's a community built on mutual servanthood, loving reciprocity, and genuine care and respect for one another that results in everyone having a share of what their most basic needs require. Now, I want to be clear. God doesn't oppose wealth. That's not what I'm saying here. God opposes greed and generosity is God's antidote to greed. Also, God isn't against power. He's against power that serves only the powerful. True strength lifts everybody. To demonstrate how anti-hierarchical the kingdom of God is, Jesus tells his disciples that if they wish to be great, then they should stop pursuing the places of honor and assume the attitude of a servant or even a slave. Discipleship, Jesus insisted, is not a ticket to greatness. Instead, it's a commitment to serving others. This commitment involves an existential shift. We move from, I have to serve, to, I get to serve. Now, there are certain things that we get to do when we submit to this kind of attitude of servanthood. First of all, we get to relinquish privileges. Leadership in the kingdom of God affords us no privileges whatsoever. Contrary to what many believe, when we give our lives to Christ, we give up all our rights because our only desire is to do the will of God. We engage in this lifelong struggle to displace our will with the will of God. Paul said this, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live in the faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Instead of providing perks or prestige, our faithfulness gets us mocked and misunderstood, just like what happened to Jesus. That's what Jesus meant when he said that we would get to drink the cup that he drinks and receive the baptism that he receives. But not only do we get to relinquish our privileges, we get to be inconvenienced. When we commit to the kingdom of God, we find ourselves at the end of the line instead of the front of the line. Our schedules take a back seat to the schedule of those whom we are called to serve. The needs of others frequently move to the forefront, requiring us to set our needs aside. Serving in the kingdom of God is inconvenient because we serve others first lowering our wants or our preferences on the priority list. Jesus said this, Whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. So there are times when I feel tired and sometimes even exhausted but my calling to ministry requires me to continue to serve. I love what Billy Graham said. One day somebody asked him, they said, do you ever get tired of ministry? And he said, "Mm, no, I don't get tired of ministry, but I sure do get tired in ministry. 
And I think that's the, result, that's the experience of all of us who feel a sense of calling to serve. <coughs> Excuse me. But when we do this, when we go the extra mile, it teaches us that God's grace is sufficient even when we think we can no longer carry on. Yes, we get to be inconvenienced, but we also get to surrender power and position. Throughout my ministry, I've had the opportunity to serve alongside some of the most influential people in the state of Alabama. People with wealth, power, and prestige. And the people among that group of folks who have had the greatest impact in my life, and I think even here in the state of Alabama, are those who never saw their wealth, their power, or their prestige as something for themselves. As a matter of fact, I can recall some specific people who would never assert their influence to add to their advantage, but they were always willing to do whatever it took to help someone who didn't have what they had. <coughs> Excuse me. They believed the influence they had was intended for the benefit of others. They humbled themselves just as Jesus humbled himself. As Paul said, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, assuming human likeness. Jesus modeled how we should live. And his model is simple. Live for others. We honor God most when we serve those whom he loves. And that's what it means to be all in. That's what true devotion is. Giving ourselves in service to others. One way that we serve is through our giving. And this is one of those situations where we take a huge step in our discipleship when we move from the point where we have to give to the place where we get to give. As a church, we're rebuilding. And any rebuilding project is resource intensive, especially in the early stages and phases of the rebuilding phase. Our ministry with children is growing. We need to pour resources into our children's ministry. Our youth ministry needs some uh, resources as we continue to build on the infrastructure that the ministry architects process is giving us. Our connect and serve ministry, the volunteer accelerator program is already showing benefits, and those benefits are just going to continue to multiply and grow. In January, we're going to have to move out of the sanctuary and begin worshiping in McDowell Hall for uh, a period while they repair all the damage that was done when the sprinkler system went off in here. Now, thankfully, insurance covers most of that cost, but there are some additional things that we feel like we need to do that won't be covered by that. During this time of rebuilding, we need to develop an even higher level of generosity through joyful giving. Paul put it this way. He said, each of you must give as you have made up your mind not regretfully or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance, so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. This is what it means uh, to live in the economy of God. In the economy of God, I can't promise you that 
when you give that you're going to get ten times back. That's the prosperity gospel. And there are a lot of preachers getting rich preaching a prosperity gospel, flying all over the United States in their jets. I reject that philosophy. We don't give to get. We give to give because we find joy in giving. But the beautiful thing about it is that when we do give, then we have the assurance, as the Scripture says in 2 Corinthians, that there will be an abundance for all, that no one will have a need, that there will be enough for everyone. Over the next several weeks, we're going to have some other folks speak and share about their stewardship journey. But I want you to be in prayer asking God, first of all, where am I on the scale of having to give or getting to give? And once you kind of determine where you are on that scale, then ask yourself, ask God to say, uh, to tell you how you can move closer to the joy of giving. Because when you experience the joy of giving, your life will be better in every respect. Your relationships will be better in every respect because the more generous you are in giving, the more generous you are in relationships. And the more the people around you will be blessed by your presence. So just give it a shot. Ask God to give you an awareness and then to give you the courage to do what you need to do. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen and amen. I invite you at this time to stand in body or spirit as we sing hymn number 121. We're just going to sing one verse of There's a Wideness in God's Mercy. I invite you to stand. in the family of God. We need a place in the family of God, but let us, like Jesus, seek to serve and not to be served. Amen. Amen.